continuing study in Nehemiah, and tonight, or right now, or we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 6 through 19. He's still dealing with some opposition, Nehemiah is, and you may remember the last time we were together. If you don't, it's, it's, it's really okay. But in chapter 4, Nehemiah had had to deal with opposition. He had, he had opposition in this way. First, there were just the, the, the verbal abuse of the enemies of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the wall. People like Sanballat and Tobiah and some of the Arabs that were surrounding the, the city, um, they were involved in this verbal opposition. That moved to a more physical uh, the, the potential of a physical threat of violence from those same people. When Sanballat and Tobiah uh, understood that their verbal assaults weren't going anywhere, word came to Nehemiah that there was the potential of, of a sort of a guerrilla warfare approach at, different, at specific points in, in rebuilding of the wall that, that they were going to attack. And so Nehemiah determined that he, for all practical purposes, would turn the city into almost a military camp. So the, the ritual was there. There were people with weapons at all times. Um, and there was even probably a little bodyguard that surrounded Nehemiah just to keep him safe as well. And we know that that, that approach worked. And we had people in, in the text that would be working but would have weapons with them as well. Now, the, the great thing about Nehemiah was that in the midst of the planning and things that he was doing, he doesn't appear that he ever neglected prayer and meditation on the Word of God. And he, he also continued to encourage those people who were working on the wall as well. So we've got, we've got those two things happening in chapter 4. When we get to chapter 5, Nehemiah has to deal with a different form of opposition, although it wasn't directed at him. It was still opposition nonetheless. In chapter 5, he was dealing with uh, opposition that was coming from within the city walls. And we talked about this last week. The workers that had been working on the wall had basically been working nonstop. And so as a result of that, their normal jobs, working in a shop, working in the fields, whatever it might be, they weren't able to do that. And because they weren't able to do that, they weren't being paid. And because they weren't being paid, they weren't able to buy food. They weren't able to pay rent or weren't able to pay for a mortgage on land or a building or whatever it might be. And so they were having to borrow money or just try to extend the loans that they had to a point where it got critical. Put them in a real bind. And, and what, what we learned last week was that these Jews were borrowing from fellow Jews. And because of that, and, and what we saw as well is that these Jews were charging their fellow Jews interest to do these things. And that is forbidden in the Old Testament. They were, they were charging interest, and, and, and as a result of that, when they couldn't be paid, these fellow Jews were basically just taking the thing that they were that these other Jews were making payments on. So if a person was making a payment on land and they couldn't pay it, the Jews were, these, these fellow Jews were just taking the land back. They were taking a building back. In some cases, they were even selling themselves into servitude to pay these debts. You know, it would be bad enough if, if they were selling themselves into servitude to the king of Persia or something like that. But what was happening was, they were actually selling themselves into servitude to their fellow Jews. Again, forbidden in Scripture for them to do that. And Nehemiah had his workers who were genuinely concerned and anxious about this and not knowing where to turn. And, and I'm grateful that the response of Nehemiah wasn't just to pat him on the back and to say, you know, it's going to be okay. Okay. 
No, he, he, and I like the way that the text reads. It, it tells us there, Nehemiah recognized that these issues had to be resolved. And he responded as we should respond when injustice occurs. Especially when injustice is occurring on the oppressed. And that is this. The scripture says that Nehemiah was angry. He was angry. And you can see that there in verse 6 of chapter 5. He says, I was angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Now, you know, we, we could then talk about the difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger or righteous indignation, <clears throat> as you've heard it called. Can I tell you this? Typically, if, if what makes you mad doesn't make Jesus mad, you're probably wrong for being mad. And I would say that for the most part, that's a lot of the time that we're angry is that it's a very selfish motive that we have. When you get angry about the injustice towards some person that society is doing, that's a little, that's different. But for the most part, when we talk about self-righteous anger, most of the time it's self-righteous, meaning I have made myself up to be some kind of personal judge and and because I have been wounded I have been affected I am angry because of that doesn't make God mad most of the time and anger as we know as well can be a very dangerous emotion <clears throat> we can say and do things that can really be foolish at times when we are angry and a lot of times after that's happened we've got to go back and ask forgiveness I can raise my hand and say, I have done that far too many times with many different people in my life. And, and I have found that most of the time when I get angry, even now, it's not a good thing. And it's, I've got to be careful about that. So, but notice in the text there in verse seven, I love this, that, that uh, Nehemiah, it says, I took counsel with myself. I took counsel with myself. Um, how much time he took here, we don't know. But, but the idea of taking counsel there is the idea of uh, considering them. One translation said, I pondered them. So the idea there was that he did not allow his anger to overrule good judgment. But he also knew he couldn't just ignore what was happening. Nor could he just gently address it <clears throat> either. He decided, he decided to address it head on with the noblemen there who had charged the interest and the other officials in the city who were participating in that as well. So first he got angry. He got angry. Secondly, he took time to consider his response. Thirdly, he called for a meeting with the nobles and the officials. It's significant at this point that he decided to meet with them first and tried to do it privately. You know, in, in a sense, he was, he was embodying Matthew 18, 15 to 18, before Matthew had been written. And, and that's the simple principle here. The scripture basically says that if you have a problem with your brother or sister, the scripture says that you are to go to them and try to resolve that issue privately first. And so, you know, if, if I know that I have offended somebody, then it's my responsibility to go to that person and to try to resolve that issue privately. Now, sadly, what happens in our culture, even among believers, is that what we have done is that we try to get popular opinion on our side about a particular issue. So if, if, somebody, if, if, um, if, if somebody is mad at, at you for, for doing something or even not doing something, but you know, sometimes that's just the case, uh, you might find that person talking to three other people to try to say, you know, didn't you think that that was wrong or whatever? Or you might even see 
something on Facebook or Instagram that is indicting you for what has happened, making something like that that public, I can tell you right now, that's a sin against that other person, and it is a sin against a holy, righteous God. That is not the way that you and I have been called to deal with differences with one another. Scripture says there in Matthew 18, go to that person and try to resolve it right there and to do it privately. Because if you've done that and they repent or they, they say, yeah, I was wrong, or, or if you go to that person and say, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have done that, and they forgive you, guess what? It's over. And you've dealt with it very privately between you and the other person. Now, Jesus gives us other means as well. So there in Matthew 18, 15, it, Jesus even says, secondly, if that person won't repent, the scripture says there that you ought to take two or three others with you to go back to that person. Now, that's not, not it's not that you've got, um, now you've got four against one and they have to repent. It's not the issue at all. I believe it's the idea of taking two or three very godly, wise people with you to urge them, to encourage them, to counsel them, to see what's occurring, to see if that person will repent and ask forgiveness. But it's not to uh, you know, hammer them or hit them over the head or anything like that or knock them out. No, it's to love them. And then that process could go on for a long time where those same people go back to them and just love that person and try to get them to see the truth and to repent and ask forgiveness. Then eventually, if that person won't do that, the scripture says, then you need to tell it to the church. Um, now, you, some people think that the, that idea of the word church there is like the um, the elders of the church and then if that person if, if that person still won't repent after the elders know that then that person is basically removed from that church fellowship and you may think well brother Mike that's sort of harsh that's what scripture says that's not me making that up that's that's what Jesus was teaching there I do think if our churches practiced this lovingly we would have uh, we probably would have fewer members for a while but then we would have probably had more members after that because there would be a value there on church membership now back to nehemiah sorry for that uh, discursion there into matthew um so what what nehemiah does if we read if we look at that so verse 7 says i took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles. For, for all practical purposes, Nehemiah became a prosecuting attorney here. And he began to lay out his case. So he says to them, you're exacting interest each from his brother. Wow. So he's making sure that they understood what was there. And at that point, he, he, as he is, he is charging them with violating biblical principles, you know, he could, have, he could have cited Exodus 22 or Leviticus 25 in the process of doing that. Nehemiah had very plainly told them that this idea of slavery as well is wrong. Let's, let's keep reading. He says, And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nation but you even sell your brothers that you may be sold to us? Wow. Nehemiah there is just condemning them. The, the idea there of slavery, he, he is telling them that is inhumane behavior. And, and slavery is an abomination in the sight of God. It just is. Can you imagine the courage that Nehemiah had to have he hadn't been in the city all that long. He had come as the cupbearer to the king, King Artaxerxes in Persia, had made that journey with just a few people. And he came and he was able to win the approval of the workers to start building that, rebuilding that wall. And he obviously had a relationship with the, um, really with the city leaders and the Jewish noblemen that were there. 
But to stand before them and to count their sin, recount their sin before them, it took an awful amount of courage. And he, see, here's the thing. Nehemiah knew. He knew that he desperately needed these officials and these noblemen. He needed their support. However, he also knew that the law of God was clear. The law of God clearly stated that what was happening was wrong. Nehemiah had made some attempt to deal with the issue, but there in verse 8, <clears throat> excuse me, back in verse 8, he tells them what they've done. They've actually bought some slaves out of slavery and brought them to the city, and then, and then they wind up selling themselves back into slavery to pay for their debts. Nehemiah was just astonished at this. <clears throat> And he's going to tell them that they've got to stop doing this. They've got to stop doing this. And, and there in verse 8, you can see that when the noblemen were approached, when these, when these uh, men were approached, in verse 8, oh, well, at the end of verse 8, he says, they were silent and could not find a word to say. So, what is he supposed to do? What is Nehemiah to do? These men are silent. They don't have anything to say to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. He very clearly had evidence that this was happening. Well, we can keep reading the text and see what Nehemiah recommends. He says, so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations uh, of our nations, our enemies, he says. So he very clearly tells them right there that these things have got to stop. He's got to do that. He's going to tell them as we, as we keep moving through this text, <clears throat> he, he's going to suggest to them, in fact, let's just keep reading. Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us, abandon, let's, let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been extracting from them. So what Nehemiah proposes here is basically what would happen during the year of Jubilee. He was just doing it a little bit earlier than would, would be uh, normally happening. And so he is, he's not proposing that, um, that, the, that the, the city tax the rich more to give to the poor. And he's not even forbidding the charging of interest to foreigners. But what he is saying there is that this has got to stop. And he even says there, this very day, give those things back to the people from whom you have taken them. Now, look at verse 10 for a minute, if you have your Bible there. Interesting, as I read this this week, he says, Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. And then he says, let us abandon this exacting of interest. Now, you know, is, is it possible that Nehemiah is confessing here that, that in the process of him lending, that he had charged interest? I, I think it's possible. I, I don't know that the text is completely clear that this is happening. If, if that is what he is saying here, what he is doing is confessing to that and saying We've got to stop that. So in effect, he is repenting of that publicly to encourage those other people to do the same thing. The second way to take it is that Nehemiah was giving grain and money to his fellow Jews and not charging any interest. And he could be saying there, here, follow my example so it, it could be either one of those things. 
Now, as I said, the men at first don't respond to Nehemiah's uh, approach there, but he does. They do wind up. They do wind up responding. You see, Nehemiah knew here as he then had to call a great assembly. As we looked back in verse seven, he said, "I held a great assembly." <clears throat> and a great assembly would be basically everybody there that had been working on the wall had to come down and watch this. Well, that meant they had to stop work. And think about this for a minute. Think about this for a minute. Do you think that, do you think that it was a good thing that it would be a good thing for Nehemiah to build the wall for the city of God to be surrounded by a wall to protect the city of God and protect the people of God while there were other people of God in that city violating the law of God. And that's the height of hypocrisy. Nehemiah knew that. Nehemiah knew that. Nehemiah knew that it would be worthless if God's people were sinning <clears throat> against God's people as well. And so he bluntly states, what you're doing is wrong. And he adds there, and I like this, shouldn't you fear the wrath of God? Yeah. Can I ask you a question as, as we are moving along here? Do you think that the world, meaning the world of lost people, unredeemed people, know what redeemed people look like. And I'm not so sure. I, I'm, I'm really not. If I were to ask you, do you believe that the word of God is inerrant? Is it inspired? Is it infallible? Everybody watching me, I'm almost completely sure 100% of you would raise your hand quickly and say, yes, I believe that then I would have to ask you this question. What difference then is it making in your day-to-day -day life? If you say that you believe that the word of God is infallible and it is inerrant and it is inspired and yet you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ as trash or you treat your neighbor in a way that is unbiblical, you do understand that's just as hypocritical as what was occurring there in the city of Jerusalem when Nehemiah was there. In the midst of, of churches calling the world to repent and have faith in Jesus, I actually believe that we ought to be calling our churches to repent. Because look, John MacArthur said, many years ago that if we're going to win the world to Jesus then the world is going to have to see what redeemed people look like and if we look like everybody else then the world will not be interested in that if the world views us as just angry people who hate people who aren't like them then they're not going to see the winsome gospel of a loving Savior. So back to Nehemiah. In there in verse 12, when he called these noblemen to repent, Scripture says, Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. So they, they repented. Nehemiah succeeded. Now I do believe that Nehemiah's humility and his sense of social responsibility there in listening to his people, <clears throat> they were very important in these issues. And he somehow convinced these noblemen, he convinced these officials that they needed to work together and it was going to cost them something. Now look, he believed what they said, but look at what he also did. And I called the priests 
and made them swear to do as they had promised. So he made them swear an oath there because he knew, and, and folks, we do too. We know this, that he knew that a human being promising to repent, promising almost to do anything is pretty easy. Following through is what? That's another thing altogether. He just didn't trust them. And frankly, he shouldn't have trusted them at this point. And the last thing that Nehemiah did was very symbolic. And the people of that day would have known exactly what he was doing because in, in his robe, he, uh, the, the Jewish people would, would have things that they valued inside something that sort of looked like a belt that they would tie around them and would tie around the robes as well. It was, in, it was very common in that day to do that. It was common to have that, those treasured items there. And so at this point, Nehemiah takes that belt and he begins to shake it. And all the things that were inside that belt began to fall to the ground. Everything fell to the ground. And what they knew was, look at what he, well, look at what he says in verse 13. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep his promise. God was going to shake them. So may he shake and shake out and empty. Meet, be shaken out and empty. It says there, and all the assembly said amen and praised Yahweh and the people did as they had promised. Let me ask you a question, a couple of questions to end here today. You know, this is a time when every, everything, there's a, just a sense of uncertainty with, with a number of things. Most of our uh, really, we're just sort of on edge, right? People want to get out of the house. They want to work. They want to go back to sitting in a restaurant and eating. They want to come back to church. Uh, you know, our, our emotions are just frayed. And the, there's just a sense of really uncertainty. And because of that, we can fly off at the handle. Now, I will tell you, for some of us, that was happening before this was happening, right? I mean, just to be honest, that was, that was happening even before. But what I want you to think about is when these things start opening back up, and even before, what about your and my day-to-day -day reactions with people in businesses, at church, where, where you work? What is our demeanor in and around believers and, and unbelievers out in the marketplace? Does, does that, does, are, we, are we just basically saying we can do what we need to do and that's just business? That attitude led the noblemen and the officials in the city of Jerusalem with Nehemiah to charge interest that was against the word of God, to take people into servitude that was against the word of God. And so we've got to be careful that somehow we separate our business life from our Christian life. Because everything about you and everything about me is to be an act of worship. And that is where the people ended this passage in Nehemiah. It says the people did as they had promised just before that. that it says there they praised Jehovah. And I hope and pray that you are praising Jehovah in the midst of these uncertain times. And Father, we do come to you today and we are grateful for who you are and what you are doing. Lord, we don't know what the future holds. That's just out of our hands. But we have a God who does. Let us trust you in what we do and what we say. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.